Today, if you're here, we're wrapping up our series through the book of Jonah, and we've been in Jonah for six weeks, only four chapters. Apparently, we're long-winded a little bit. Um, but we're going to be wrapping it up, and, and I want to talk about something that's pretty important um, to an overall understanding of the Bible, right? And here it is. I'm going to boil it down to one sentence, which I don't often do. Uh, Jesus is the hero of the story. Everybody want to say that with me? Jesus is the hero of the story. That's much more, my wife does kids' church. She's better at stuff like that. But um, the Bible, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. And so there are a lot of practical tips There are a lot of great principles we can learn. There's a lot of uh, great application for our lives within the pages of Scripture. But it's a story about Jesus. And so when we we read it, we need to always be cognizant of that fact, okay? Because if, if we read it in a way that makes us into the star then we really shortchange the message of the gospel. We really um, detract from the real star of Jesus, who is the hero of the story. And so that's really part of the genius of Scripture, in my opinion. Um, It's really one of the more compelling proofs, um, as we'll see, for uh, the inspiration of Scripture, that though it was written over 1,400 years by, I want to say, 40 different authors, for whatever reason that fact is escaping me at the moment, it all works together seamlessly to tell this one cohesive story about the person and, and the life of Jesus Christ. Raise your hand if you've ever seen the, the movie The Sixth Sense. Sixth Sense. All right. Now, raise your hand if the quality of The Sixth Sense has duped you into seeing every M. Night Shyamalan since then, expecting it to be good. <sighs> A lot of wasted hours of my life holding out for the hope that he would repeat that and never has once happened. But uh, sideways rant, okay? Do you remember how you felt the first time that you saw the sixth sense? Do you remember? Anybody remember the first time that? And at the end of the movie, they revealed this one detail and it, it changes everything that you had seen previously. All of a sudden, the whole movie starts to fit together. And uh, his death is the key in this movie that begins to make it all make sense. Bruce Willis, he's this uh, psychologist for like the one person who hasn't seen that movie. And very beginning of the movie, he's shot. The rest of the movie, we believe that he is healed, that he recovered. But it turns out in the end that he was dead the whole time, okay? And unless you're that one guy who likes to claim that they caught it, Wes, uh, <laughs> then everybody else, nobody saw it coming. If you, if you ask Wes later, he literally will tell you, I saw it in the first six minutes. I was there, and I remember it. Sarah can neither confirm nor deny. I don't know. Um, but, but most of us, the majority of humanity, watched that movie, and we had no clue about the plot line. And, and the same thing, I believe, is true with the Bible. The same thing is true with Jesus if we don't know that he's the st- hero of the story. You can read the whole Bible and you can miss Jesus in scenes in every passage, every story of Scripture. Because if you don't know that he's the hero of the story, then you're not looking for him in the Old Testament. You're not looking for Jesus in some of the sacrificial laws of Leviticus and Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, You're not looking for Jesus in the stories of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham and Enoch and all these other people. But when you know that he's the hero of the story and you go back and you read it again... It changes everything. We have this uh, story in the New Testament, the book of Luke, right? And Jesus is here, and it gives us the great story, okay? Uh, One day after Jesus had died, but before everyone knew he was resurrected, two disciples are walking along a road, and they're on this famous road called the Road to Emmaus. And these disciples are kind of uh, shooting the breeze. They're kind of uh, sad because their Messiah or would-be Messiah had just died. And suddenly, Jesus appears beside them. Now, we know it's Jesus because we're the readers, and it says Jesus appeared beside them. But these guys had no idea. They're just walking, and this random traveler comes up to them and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? What are you guys discussing? And they say, well, are you the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about these things, about the prophet who who was to be the Messiah but then died? And Jesus suddenly reveals himself to them and says, I am, I'm Jesus. 
and they were blinded to it. They, they hadn't seen him. They missed him. Luke 24, verse 27 says it this way. It says, And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. See, they, they had missed Jesus, uh, literally and, and figuratively, right? They had missed him in the Old Testament. And Jesus, he begins talking with them, and it's a pretty long walk, apparently, because Jesus just begins breaking down from uh, Genesis to, uh, they didn't really have Revelation, to Malachi at the time, and saying, I was there, and, and that, was, that was me. And when they were talking about that, they were talking about me. See, he's, he's the hero of the story. And he's the key through which all of Scripture finds its fulfillment and finds its meaning. And when you realize this, it changes everything. It changes how you read the Bible. Like the, the two guys on the road to Emmaus, or like all of us, and many of us anyway, who, who saw the sixth sense and all of a sudden you, you watch that flashback at the end and you're like, oh, that's why his shirt looked funny, or that's why the wedding ring wasn't there or was there. All of a sudden these things start to make sense. Sorry, I'm very passionate about that movie. And, and you see a lot of connections that you hadn't seen before. And so with that in mind, I want to close out this series of, of Jonah by looking at, at the similarities between Jesus and Jonah. You see, Jesus is in every way a better Jonah. Jesus is the true and, and better Jonah, in fact. If, I'm not going to reread the story, but I want to highlight some of the details, okay? Just if you haven't been here all six weeks and you're not like a, a Bible scholar, haven't been reading Jonah with us, I will recap. <coughs> Whoa, that was amplified, I'm sorry. <coughs> I will recap quickly. Jonah, he was a prophet uh, <coughs> who was called by God in Jonah chapter 1 to go to the nation of Nineveh and to warn them of their impending destruction. The Ninevites were his enemies, right? And so he, he initially ran from that calling. He boarded a ship, and he went far away from the mission that God had called him to. While he was sleeping in that ship in the beginning half of chapter one, a great storm came upon the ship. And, and the solution at that time to calm the storm and save everybody's life was to throw Jonah into the sea. This was Jonah's idea. It wasn't the sailors were actually good guys in it. And Jonah, after being caught, tossed over the boat into the sea, he was swallowed by a giant fish. For three days, he stayed in the belly of this fish. And reluctantly, after the fish miraculously spat him up on ground, uh, he went on with the mission that God had told him to. God had said, you know, <laughs> you disobeyed me. I'm going to swallow you with a fish and spit you back on ground. And that was enough to reset Jonah. So he reluctantly goes to Nineveh to tell them. But secretly, we saw, he was hoping for their destruction. In fact, after Jonah stepped into Nineveh, he's like, oh, you guys need to repent or you're going to die. He walked away and he camped out on a hill, secretly hoping that God would like throw down some fire and brimstone, okay? And God rebuked him. So that is the, that is the synopsis, okay? Very elementary synopsis of the book of Jonah. But if, if we read the whole book of Jonah only looking at Jonah or, or only looking at how it applies to our lives or the, the principles or applications that we can learn, we'd miss out on what the story says about Jesus. See, as Jonah was sent to save an evil nation, so Jesus came to save humanity. See, that's the, that's the whole gospel message. Jonah is paralleled as he goes to, he goes to evil uh, of Nineveh. Jesus saves humanity. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says it this way. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. Jesus didn't come reluctantly but he willingly laid down his life. He willingly laid down his divine nature to take on human flesh in the incarnation and, and he was born a, a baby. He didn't run from his mission. He embraced it. He took it on willingly. Later when Jonah, he, he fell asleep in the hull of the ship, we saw a direct parallel, and I talked about this, I believe, in the second message of the series, that um, there's a direct parallel to the life of Christ that the gospel writers put in there. See, in, in Mark 4, Jesus has this very similar circumstance. He, too, is sleeping in a boat. The disciples had had a long day, 
and Jesus was, was preaching, and they cast out on the shore, or on the lake. And when they're there, Jesus is sleeping in the hull of the boat, and then this giant storm comes on. And the disciples, in a very funny fashion, they, they go down and they shake Jesus and they say, Jesus, wake up, we're, we're dying, we're the boat, don't you care about us? And Jesus, he kind of wipes the sleep out of his eyes and walks to the front and says, like, quiet to the wind. And all of a sudden, the waves die down. And he rebukes the disciples and say, says to them, why were you scared, you of little faith? See, Jesus, in, in his circumstance, when he was sleeping in the boat, he was sleeping because he had full confidence of his place in God. He, he was sleeping in a place of full faith in who God was and what his plan and his purpose for his life was. Jonah, when we saw him sleeping in the boat, he was sleeping because he was kind of in a depressing funk. Like Jonah was running from the mission of God, and, and the, the dialogue reveals that he was at a place in his life where he really didn't care one way or the other. In fact, when the sailors wake him up, he says, yeah, go ahead and throw me in. God will probably relent if he kills me. He, he's lost all hope. He's running from God. He's out of the place of God's will. But Jesus directly contrasts that because he's in the, the center of his divine calling. The, the final thing, Jonah, when he is thrown into the sea, he's swallowed by a fish, right? Jonah swallowed by this giant fish, and I talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago, right? If you've had this conversation with a friend, and many of us have, if you're a, a Christ follower, many people will say, how can you believe in a book where a man was swallowed by a giant fish? Um, that is like the least unbelievable thing in the Bible, okay? There are so many more unbelievable things in the Bible. Our faith is based on a guy who came back from the dead, and so if, if he can do that, uh, I've just got to believe that he can make a giant fish swallow a man. And furthermore, uh, the guy who came back from the dead quotes from the book of Jonah. And so he seemed to be pretty confident that it was something that happened. Anyway, though, so when Jonah was thrown from the boat and swallowed by the giant fish, he spent three days in the belly of the fish for his sins. He was, he was sort of being punished for what he had done wrong. But when Jesus in the New Testament dies, he spends three days in the tombs for the sins of the world. See, Jesus is a better Jonah. Jonah, he reluctantly went to Nineveh, but Jesus willingly picks up his cross in the New Testament and he carries it all the way to the hill where he will be crucified for all of us. Even when Jonah, he, he finally spoke to the Ninevites and he went, even though he was reluctant and unwilling, he was hoping that, that God would smite or, or kill or punish the people for all the wrong that they had done. But Jesus, when he's outside of Jerusalem in the New Testament before he goes to the cross, he, it says that Jesus wept for the city. Luke 19.41 says, When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace but now they're hidden from your eyes. Despite everything he had been through, he had compassion on the people. His will was for the people to turn to him, to, to repent, to change their ways, and not to be punished at any cost, even the cost of his own life. Jesus is a better Jonah. Where, where Jonah failed, Jesus triumphs. Where Jonah wandered, Jesus stayed the course. He's the hero, and, and he's the key to understanding all of the scripture. The, the scripture will say that Jesus is the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end from, from A to Z. If we go from the Old Testament, it's been said that Jesus is a better Adam. In fact, the New Testament and the book of Hebrews will pick up this language. It'll say that, that the first Adam, our father, sinned, and, and through him we all have consequences. We all have desires and natures that are bent towards evil. But Jesus is... The, the last Adam, through his sacrifice, we're all cleansed. He's a better Abel. In the book of Genesis, I think it's Genesis, I'm going to make up a number, I won't do that. In the book of Genesis, Cain and Abel, the first brothers, uh, Cain kills Abel because he's jealous and Abel's blood cries out from the ground. Jesus is a better Abel, his blood was spilled, but we're forgiven 
through it. He's a better Abraham who, who left all that he knew to go to a place far away for the hope of blessing the nations. Jesus left all he knew in heaven and came to earth. He's a better Isaac. He's a better Jacob. He's a better Joseph and, and Moses. He's a better Job. Every story in the Old Testament, we get these pictures of original characters and, and historical characters whose lives personified and pointed to the Messiah. Many times we talk about King David and we talk about David and Goliath. And so often that story, and I'm probably guilty of it, right? The story is taught in a way that says that God can help you overcome the giants in your life. But, but if we really want to be accurate to Scripture, so often the, the, the message of that story is that Jesus is a better David. That, that we can't destroy the giants in our lives on our own, but Jesus empowers us to. That it's really Jesus who's defeating the giants that we face. Though we couldn't do it on our own, he overcomes. Jesus is the hero of the story. And his life shows us the fullness of what a human life can and should be, right? Jesus came, uh, says that I came to give life and life to the full. So many people in the world today aren't living life to the full. And to be honest, I'm not even sure many of us in this room could say that we're really living life to the full. But we see in Jesus the picture of someone who did. He was perfectly in the will of God at all times. He was perfectly in the plan of God at all times. And he was perfectly comfortable in the strength of who he was in God. And his life shows us what our life can be, what a life of obedience and submission to the Holy Spirit can be. He's a better Ryan He's a better Jessica. He's a better Stephanie. He's a better Mark. And when we learn from him, we too can become better too. See, Jesus, he, he lived the life we couldn't live and he died the death we deserved so that one day we might have the life that only he can provide. So as we close today, as corny as this is, I, I want to ask you one question, right? Do you see Jesus? Do you see him? Do you see him in your daily life? Do you see him when you're facing temptation? Do you see him after you've chosen temptation and sin? Do you see Jesus in the midst and in the moment? Because it'll change how you interpret things. It'll change how your daily activities shape your direction and, and how they determine your destination. Do you see Jesus? In the movie The Sixth Sense, the little boy says, I see dead people. I see dead people. And it unlocks the whole movie, and it's so corny. 15 years later, I have no idea how long that movie is. And as a side note, Haley Joel Osment grew up to be a remarkably less cute kid. Um, adult, maybe. Anyway, but, but that, that one phrase changes everything for the movie. And that one, that one application, that one point can change everything for your life. Do you see Jesus? Not just on Saturday night, not just on Sunday if you go to church like most of America, but do you, do you see him? Do you see him when you're at work? Do you see him when you're in your car by yourself? Do you see him when you're gossiping with your coworkers? Do you see Jesus? Do you allow the Holy Spirit opportunity to connect in your life? and to shape the decisions that you make on a daily basis, not just something that once a week you, you repent of or you ask for forgiveness or you feel sorry about or guilty about, but, but on an ongoing basis, do you allow the Holy Spirit to shape your direction? Because once your eyes are open to the reality of Jesus, once your eyes are open to the reality of Jesus in Scripture and you read the stories and you, you see the application and you see the personification of his life in the, in the stories... It begins to change the way you live. You realize that he's always present, but he's always present to help you. He's always present to guide you, no matter how great your need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see Christ. Help us to know you more. It's not always easy. There's a lot of noise in our lives, God. There's a lot, of, a lot of static. There's a lot of things clamoring for our attention. Every second of the day seems to be planned and prioritized and 
organized. And if we're not careful, sometimes there doesn't seem to be any room for you. So often we, we live our lives focusing on the urgent. We live our lives focusing on what's pressing or, or what we've prioritized. And if we're not careful, we can leave out the things that are most important. We can leave out space to connect with the divine. We can leave out space to feed what is eternal. God, I pray this week as each of us leave this room that you would guide us, that you would inspire us, that you would direct us and speak to us in a new way, in a mighty way. And I pray for each and every person in this room, God, that the conviction of this message would, would fall in their life in a small way. That's not necessarily something I pray for often, God, but I pray that this week, as they leave this place, that your Holy Spirit would do something in their lives. That there would be a moment between now and next Saturday where you just impress upon them that you are present. That no matter what kind of mess they've gotten themselves into, no matter what kind of sin or, or situation they're in, that you are there, that you're with them, and that you're willing to wade through the darkest waters if it means they too might turn and, and live life to the potential that you've created them for. Jesus, I pray for anybody in the room today who says maybe, maybe they don't know you. Maybe they've lived a life away from you. Maybe there was a time in their life where they used to follow you, but if they're honest, it's been a long time. If that's the case, I just want to give an opportunity for anybody who's here today who just wants to take a step of faith and say, you know what, I, I want to connect with God. I want to reconnect with God. If that's you, nobody's looking around. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Just slip up your hand. It's a, a step of faith. It doesn't save you, but it's a small action step that says, you know what, I'm serious about this. Today's going to be different. Today's the day I make a choice to move closer to Christ. Heavenly Father, we praise you. You're a holy and awesome God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the opportunity and the freedom we have as citizens of this country to come before you, to worship you freely, and to speak about you boldly, God. May this week be the, the fullest week in our lives that we've ever experienced, God. Help us to enjoy the holiday to enjoy our family against all odds, to enjoy the food. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.